How can we stop death by PowerPoint? Before we start, I know you're probably thinking, how can this guy possibly talk to me about improving my PowerPoints when starting with a slide like this? So let me try something else really quick. There. Does that inspire more confidence? No? How about now? Still nothing? Wait, I know what is missing. Clip art. Okay, wait just one second. Before you click on that back button or type in a new Google search term, I'll make my point. Tip number one, don't begin your presentation with a template that came with the program. Whether it's PowerPoint, Keynote, or Prezi, try to come up with something or find something other than the default templates. We have all seen a presentation using these templates before, and chances are one or more of these presentations have been atrocious. That has already put a bad taste in our mouth as soon as we see a presentation using one of these templates. Just like you start with that sense of, oh no, when you see a presentation start with something like this, you will do the same thing to your audience if you use one. Use a template that comes with your program and you'll lose your audience at the very beginning. For finding free PowerPoint templates, start by going to Microsoft's website and finding an acceptable template from their repository. You can do this by, first, going to Google and searching for free PowerPoint templates. Find the link that goes to Microsoft's website. Scroll to the bottom and select PowerPoint. Then search through their templates and find one that A you haven't seen before and B fits the content of your presentation. Scroll down and click Next if you need more templates. Once you have found one you like, click on it. Then click Download. Once it is downloaded, see if it is what you want. If not, start the process over. If it is, you're good to go. Starting with a fresh new template will give your audience the impression that you spent a long time preparing for your presentation, and they'll appreciate that. So this presentation will cover how to help avoid the phenomenon known as death by PowerPoint, or the act of killing your audience due to presenting a horrible presentation. Although I'll say PowerPoint throughout the presentation, know that the tips and tricks I talk about throughout are applicable to any presentation aid or any presentation software. Therefore, this is transferable to Prezi, to Keynote, even to old school flipping sheets on a paper board, or any other type of form of presentation aid. Hopefully, by the end of the presentation, you will learn the importance of impact in your presentations. Also, you'll hopefully get some ideas on how to enhance your PowerPoints as well as tips on how to enhance your overall presentation. As we get started, I want to point out that this presentation is heavily influenced by two sources. First, the SlideShare presentation, Death by PowerPoint and How to Fight It, by Alexei Kaptarev, is a great resource. It focuses heavily on fixing your presentation materials and aids. Secondly, the book Death by PowerPoint, How to Avoid Killing Your Presentation and Sucking the Life Out of Your Audience by Sherry Kerr is a little dated, but it has great information regarding how to use your PowerPoints and work on presentation skills to deliver the perfect presentation. Outside of these two resources, I've done a little bit of research here and there and have lived through and delivered horrible presentations. All of this information is combined in this presentation so that you can hopefully learn from all of our mistakes. So when it comes to presentations, remember that there are two equally important parts that are in play. You must have both parts in play or else you'll lose your audience. The two elements are content and presentation. Whether in work, school, or general interest, we have all seen a presentation where the speaker was engaging, funny, walking around, but in the end, all we could do was stare at the PowerPoint slides, more than likely reading them like they were a book. We have no idea what the presenter said because we were drawn like a magnet to that slide. We have also seen the presentations where the slides look beautiful or a new technology is being used, but the presenter sounds like Ben Stein on Ferris Bueller's Day Off. He keeps droning on and on and on. And soon we realized that no amount of makeup and no amount of mascara on that presentation could make it look pretty. On the opposite side, we have all been to a presentation that we expected to be so boring that we would rather spend an afternoon watching golf, which I apologize to any golf enthusiasts, it's just not my cup of tea. However, 
When the presenter started talking, we couldn't help but stare and listen intently. Both presentation and content must be perfected and work in sync to deliver a killer presentation. Remember, too, that to some extent, your presentation needs to entertain. If it isn't entertaining, it is more than likely boring. If it is boring, then they aren't buying what you're selling. They aren't listening. So throw some humor in there, throw some jokes in there, get your point across, but do it in a manner that is also exciting to watch. Lastly, remember that the first impression is your only chance to speak from a clean slate. So don't screw it up. First, like I mentioned earlier, go and find a template to use or make one yourself. Don't use the templates that come with the program. It'll start you off on the wrong foot. The other thing I would do is to start the presentation with something other than just a slide with your name and title of the presentation. That's a boring way to start and it makes it hard for you as the presenter to get into a good flow. Rather, start with a story, or start with a joke, or start with some kind of random point that you can bring back around to your topic. If you'll remember, this presentation started by making a point, not by saying, my name is Mark Gale and today I'll be talking about whatever, whatever. If you start with a good story, they'll be waiting to hear how the story ends. So without further ado, let's look at what you're probably really caring about, the tips and tricks on how to make a good PowerPoint. First, we're going to start with the content side of the content presentation dichotomy. The first tip, stick with the need to know style of information. Get your point across, but also give the audience what it wants. For example, I could have started this presentation with a detailed history of presenting, or giving you the differences between the various presentation software products or the various versions of those software products. Technically, it relates to what I'm talking about, so I could have stuck it in there and it might have made sense. However, do you really care? No. And if you do, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but you should probably go and find another presentation to listen to. But in all seriousness, that information doesn't emphasize the points that I'm trying to cover, and it isn't something the audience, on average, wants to hear about. So let's just go ahead and leave it out. Next tip, keep it simple. Each slide should cover a minimum number of points, preferably one. On overview slides like we saw earlier, I personally don't like covering more than three points, and those points are generally easy and brief. Otherwise, one point per slide. Another area to keep simple are graphs and images. Try to make one point per graph or one point per image. For example, the image of the car would talk about the electronic components of a hybrid car required to run the engine. Or at least I think it would because I'm definitely not a car expert. If I was presenting this as a new concept car to a board meeting, I could also talk about safety features, steering systems, aerodynamics, and more using this image, but it would overwhelm the audience. It's too complicated. So keep it simple. One point per slide, one point per graph, one point per image. Too complicated. This is probably some kind of nuclear reactor, but who knows? This type of example was mentioned in the SlideShare presentation that I talked about earlier. And let me tell you, just like they said in there, if you put this thing in English, it still doesn't make a lot of sense. Keep it simple. This is too complicated. Tip number three. Pictures speak louder than words. Please use pictures throughout your presentations. They're so much better to look at than text, text, text. For those of you that have a command of the English language, and I don't mean that in a good way, but rather that put every word in a dictionary on your slide way, using pictures will help you minimize the number of words you can put on a slide. So here are a couple of tips when using pictures on your slides. First, don't use clip art. Unless you're presenting to people that still think Amazon.com primarily sells trees, I'm sorry about the bad joke, we have all seen abuses to clip art use and that we have all been tainted by it. Instead, pay the couple of dollars to download photos from stock sites such as thinkstockphotos.com. If you want to go the free route, investigate photos marked as Creative Commons. In those instances, you can usually use those photos for educational and nonprofit uses as long as you don't use them for proprietary purposes. Before using a Creative Commons photo, be sure to read the guidelines and legal statements associated with that photo. Second, if you know how to use Photoshop or you have the ability to crop pictures to a circle, use circles rather than squares. Circles tend to draw the eye more towards them. They're more interesting. 
regardless of whether or not you use a circle, put a border around them. It makes them look classier. It makes them look more professional. Tip number three. If you're going to use a circular picture or a picture that's cut out, they add a great looking effect. Well, they're a great looking effect as long as you don't have that weird white box around them. Make sure that the background on any circle or any image that has been cut out is transparent. Otherwise, you end up looking technologically dumb rather than really cool and sophisticated. For those of you that know Photoshop or a similar program, JPEG files do not save transparency. You have to use something like a PNG file if you want it to have a chance of being transparent. Tip 4. Big pictures can be shrunk with no problem. Little pictures that you blow up end up looking grainy and tacky. So generally speaking, especially if you're buying the pictures, buy the highest quality and the biggest size you can get for the amount of money you're looking at spending. Be sure to keep an eye on the file size though. Big pictures will look crisp and awesome, but they take up a lot of space. And tip five. Lastly, when using images to emphasize a point, like I've done in most of these slides, Make sure the image actually has something to do with the topic of the slide. If you're talking about something like the Roman Empire, it serves no purpose to have a picture of a red barn with a bed of flowers out front. Don't do that. Also, when placing a complementary photo, it is best to place it on the right-hand side of the screen. Since we read left to right, you want to make sure that they read the points first, hence the words are on the left, and then you use the image to reinforce it. Hence the image is on the right. So put the image on the right, put your words on the left. Alright, the next major tip. When conceptualizing and developing your PowerPoints, keep in mind the use of good complementary colors. Everyone has an idea of what colors they want to use in their presentations. Sometimes it can be your favorite color, sometimes it can be a color combination that will set a certain mood. Regardless of why you choose a color, be sure to use good complementary colors with it. You can easily go to Google and research color theory and read about how to choose complementary colors. In the meantime, the first site listed here will take you to a free online color wheel. The color wheel is an essential tool in determining complementary colors. The second link is a way to change the color you find on that free color wheel to a color that PowerPoint can use. However, let's quickly look at an easier way to determine complementary colors for those of us that are less inclined to hear all this technical mambo jambo. Here's a quick and easy way to know if a color is going to look good and what complementary colors it goes with. Simply think of a color you want to use. In this case, let's say purple. Then go and find a professional sports team that uses the same color, in this case, the Baltimore Ravens. Now look at the other colors they use with the purple. Those are complementary colors. Sports teams pay thousands of dollars to make sure that their logos look good and the colors are complements. They've done all the research for you, so go ahead and use it. In this case, gold would be a decent complementary color to use in a purple presentation. Ten seconds and bam, you have your complementary colors. In this case, they did not find an appropriate sports team. Whoa. Tip number five. Choose your words carefully. The more words you put on a slide, the less impact the words will have. That means that the more words you put, the less your audience will remember them. Do you listen to someone more when they say, look out, there's a fire over there, or when they say, fire, run? Fewer words are better. As we said earlier, using more images on your slide will limit the amount of space you can use for words, but people still find ways to put too many words on there. Try to make a conscious effort to use 10 or less words on a slide unless you have a legitimate reason to have more. And reading passages from a slide is not a legitimate reason. This tip goes closely with the choose your words carefully tip. This is also the one that most people give me the evil stare when I mention. I'm going to go ahead and say it. I think people should use more slides. Whoa, before you go ballistic, let me explain. The main problem with presentation length isn't the number of slides, but it is the amount of content. I've seen it way too often where someone thinks that they're going to go 20 minutes over their allotted time, so they start cutting slides. However, their presentation doesn't get any shorter. Why? 
because all they start doing is copying and pasting the words from one slide onto the other. That is the problem. It doesn't matter if you have 20 or 40 slides. If you don't cut out the actual content, then the presentation doesn't get any shorter. All you've done is crammed your slides with even more words and made your audience hate you even more without actually cutting out any time. More slides with fewer words are actually better because they have more impact. The trick is when cutting down the length of your presentation, you have to actually cut out content, not just shift it around to a fewer number of slides. Briefly, I'm going to give you an example of what I mean. First off, stop reading the slide and listen. That is a reason not to put so many words on a slide. Your audience will read the slide rather than listen to you. Worse off, they read faster than you can talk. So if you put the words up on one slide, they'll finish reading before you and wonder why you're taking so long. So don't do that. Now the point of this slide is not the content on it. It is an example. This is a slide from an old presentation by a colleague of mine. I've taken the information and broken it into multiple slides using a lot of the tips we've already talked about. See which one has more impact. Does this slide have impact? Or this? When filling out the education section of a resume, be sure to put in any minor that you have obtained or any concentration or professional area that you focused on that would be applicable to the position you're applying for. It's also important to show any relative coursework you've taken to show that you have some hands-on experience. Lastly, be sure to put down any honors you graduated with. By putting the honors you obtained on your resume, it showed you that you stood out from the average crowd in your academic career. These three slides cover the material in that long, text-heavy slide. Notice how these three had more impact, or they should have had more impact, and you have a better chance of remembering them now. Even though it took three slides to point out the information, I covered those three slides faster than I would have been able to cover with the one text slide. This is a good example of why more slides is not necessarily a bad thing. The last content tip looks at multimedia. I don't have a problem with using multimedia in a presentation. Just make sure that A, it serves a purpose, and B, you know what you're doing. By serving a purpose, the multimedia should either emphasize a point or serve as an attention break. By knowing what you're doing, I mean to make sure that the movie is properly edited and fits into the presentation. When you click play, it should automatically start playing and it should start playing at the correct spot. Nothing looks worse than you trying to find 7 minutes and 8 seconds in a 20 minute movie to start the clip. Actually, I take it back. The only thing that's worse is to make them watch the first 7 minutes and 8 seconds of non-related content to get it to that starting point. Know what you're doing when using multimedia. So a quick recap of the content tips. Make it a simple and need to know basis. Use pictures and complementary colors. Choose your words carefully. Don't get caught in the number of slides versus content dilemma. And finally, be careful with multimedia. Now let's look at the second half of the presenting dichotomy. Not only does your content need to be good, but you need to know how to present it as well. The first tip to presenting well is the need to engage your audience. When giving a presentation, the audience will feed off of the energy that you start with. If you are walking around and smiling and having a good time, the audience will reciprocate that back. But if you start out nervous and fidgety behind the podium, they're probably going to disengage from you very, very quickly. Now some of you may be thinking, how can I enjoy giving a presentation? I hate giving presentations. Well, in that case, fake it. The best way to get into a groove, whether you're faking it or not, is to start out with a joke or a story or an example leading into one of your main points. It generally gets you as the presenter more relaxed than just starting off with your name and title of a presentation. A story or a joke would usually get at least some nods or a laugh or two. You begin feeding off of that positive energy towards you. At that point, you're golden. Starting a presentation with a name and title slide normally just starts out with that audience staring blankly back at you. So go ahead and start with a joke. Start with a story. Get engaged with your audience. Engaging them from the very beginning is key. Tip number two is to remember that you are the star of the presentation, not your PowerPoint. That's another reason why it is so important not to put a lot of words on your slides. 
your audience is there to see you. Your audience is there to listen to you. If you were going to put all the words on the PowerPoint anyways, why not just email them a copy of the presentation to read, and then you save them the cost of having to go and see you? How do you be the star? First off, don't read your PowerPoint. It's extremely important. Second, act like those self-help gurus that you see in the movies all the time. Do those self-help people stand behind the podium and talk? Not generally, because that is boring and no one wants to pay to see that. They're out in front. They're walking around. They're using their hands to emphasize points rather than nervously gripping a podium. Get into the habit of walking in front of the podium. Get into the habit of walking in front of your audience. It makes you much more personable and likable as a presenter. Remember that they are there to see and hear you. Be the star you're supposed to be. Tip 3. Interact with your audience. What is the easiest way to get over the nervousness of talking to an audience? Get the audience to talk for you. Ask them questions. Do some polls where they raise their hands. Throw out a point and get the audience to talk about it amongst themselves before continuing. All of these are ways to get your audience to interact with you. Remember that most people don't want to sit still for 50 minutes listening to a speech. Attention spans usually only last from about 15 to 20 minutes. Therefore, every 15 minutes, you need to allow the audience to do something to break up the monotony. Also, remember that when the audience is interacting with you, you get to take a break from being the star for a few seconds. Let the audience interact with you. It's going to be a lifesaver. Please, practice, practice, practice. Practice makes perfect isn't a popular saying for no reason. It's true. No matter how well you think you know the subject material, you cannot just wing a presentation. The audience will know. Believe me, they will know. Whether you think they will know or not, I promise you, they will know. You can't just look over it 15 minutes beforehand and expect to be ready to go. Even if you've taught the subject a million times, you still need to do a practice run or two before you present it. The audience can tell when it is fresh and when it isn't. So, for those of you that still don't believe me, let me tell you the little story about the tortoise and the hare, the PowerPoint version. All of us have seen the tortoise present. He talks real slow, and every other line is an... Um, a stopping, um, a pause because he's um, unprepared. It's horrible. But then you have the hare that's really nervous and they talk super fast and runs through the slides at a mind-boggling pace that you can't possibly get anything from because they're going so fast. Again, it's horrible. Don't be a tortoise. Don't be a hare. Be something in between like a horse or something. You can only do that when you practice. The point is you have to practice. Only by practicing can you avoid being a tortoise or being a hare. The last tip I'm presenting is to avoid dead time. You can learn to avoid dead time by, wait for it, practicing. Dead time is a theater term describing that awkward silence between the scenes when everything is dark and the stage hands are moving the set pieces around. Sitting in the dead silence in the dark. Really awkward and uncomfortable. That's why most plays now have some kind of music or sound effects that go on during that time. It makes you feel like things are still going on. It avoids that awkwardness. We have dead time and scene changes in our PowerPoints too. What do I mean? This usually occurs when you're changing slides. Most people will finish a slide, click, glance over that slide, then start talking. If you practice, you have a good idea of your slide order. This will allow you to avoid dead time because you no longer have to glance over that slide before you start talking. You can just move into the next slide and start right away. Don't be awkward. Avoid dead time. So quickly recapping. When presenting, engage your audience early. Remember that you are the star, so act like it. Be interactive with the audience. Practice, practice, practice. And for good measure, one more time, practice. And by practicing you're able to avoid what's called dead time. So let me give you a couple of closing tips. These are tips that are outside of the content tips and presentation tips. The first one deals with group presentations. If you're going to give a group presentation, practice it as a group. You're only as strong as your weakest link. That means that each of you need to give a killer presentation for it to be successful. More importantly, 
just as you have dead time between your own slide transitions, you will have major dead time between transitioning through different presenters. Only by practicing as a group will you be able to overcome that dilemma. Watch your time. If you're presenting with more presenters to follow you, be professional and courteous to them and end on time. More importantly, your audience knows how much time you have allotted to speak. We've all been in a class before where five minutes before it ends, the students are ruffling papers and shutting their books and squirming in their desks. They know. They are trying to hint something to you. Same goes with presentations. An audience will never be upset if you end a little early, but if you run over on time, they will not be pleased. Be ready for disruptions. What happens when the computer doesn't work? Can you deliver your presentation without it? What if no one laughs at a joke? Are you going to get flustered? What if the person presenting before you runs over on their time? Your audience doesn't care. They still want you to end on time. Be ready to adjust. When it comes to handouts, here's my stance. Handouts are good, but I think you should only give them out at the end of the presentation. Otherwise, your audience is more than likely reading them and flipping ahead when they should be listening to what you have to say. Let them know that you'll have handouts at the end so they aren't stressing out and trying to write down everything you say, but by giving them at the end, you also allow them to pay attention. Also, I would make the handouts a little more text heavy and a little less picture heavy. This will obviously take more time as now you have to make two presentations, one for the handouts and one to actually present. The trick is to remember that the handouts are intended to be read where your presentation is more intended to be heard. So that's the gist of the presentation. I hope it was useful and you got something out of it. Please feel free to share the tips with anyone and use any of the references I pointed out at the beginning of the presentation. Also, feel free to contact me if you have any questions or if you need any help with your PowerPoints. With your help, we can soon live in a world where people do not needlessly need to suffer from a death by PowerPoint. Thank you for your time.